My name is Major Ron Hathaway, United States Marine Corps retired. I will be hosting the day for the Armed Forces Heritage Museum in New Jersey. Today's guest is Dr. Brian Smith, President and CEO of the Tuskegee Airmen Museum in Detroit, Michigan. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Hi, Dr. Smith. Uh, tell me about yourself and uh, how you became President and CEO of the Tuskegee Museum in Detroit. Sure, and thank you for uh, having me today. I was born in Washington, D.C., actually grew up in Alabama in the shadow of the Apollo program and therefore became an engineer. Early childhood, I had a love for medicine, and finally, I mixed the two together, engineering and medicine, so biomedical engineering. That's what the, uh, my PhD is in. When I was about 12, my father sat me down over a period of maybe two months every Saturday afternoon at the same time, and he was telling me this story story about his military uh, career or, or experience. He was captured by the Germans, World War II. And before he was captured, his unit guarded the air base of the Tuskegee Airmen. The significant thing about his unit, the 366 Infantry, was they had all black officers. Most of the infantry units of African-American men were led by white officers. So before he went to the front, he guarded the air base, he watched them fly and was amazed at the things they could do with airplanes. That kind of fostered in me a love for flying. Of course, growing up, uh, the child of two school teachers, wasn't much money around. So it wasn't until I became an adult that I started to learn how to fly. And it was actually a Tuskegee Airman that taught me how to fly. I met one in the late 70s. Uh, we were in a hobby shop. He was contending with the, uh, the clerk about a four blade propeller. I started asking questions and he finally turned to me and said, I flew a P-51 in World War II. And I got all excited. I went to his home. I listened to his story. He actually gave me a remote control airplane. Uh, and I felt, felt that I owed him something back and I started volunteering with the Detroit chapter of Tuskegee Airmen. It grew from there to being the president of the chapter to being the president of Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, which is a national organization that um, manages chapters all around uh, the country. And as time went on, the airmen recognized that I had this love and this zeal and that I should lead the museum into the next uh, century. And that's how I became the uh, president of Tuskegee Airmen National Museum. How did the museum reach out to uh, the community? We reach out in several ways. We do uh, through the Experimental, Experimental Aircraft Association, a Young Eagle Rally between the months of April and October. And, and that's where we give free airplane rides to uh, students in the city of Detroit. So between the ages of eight and 17, come out to the airport, get a free airplane ride. At that event, we recruit students for our other programs. We have a flight academy. We're actually a licensed uh, flight school in the state of Michigan. And we teach uh, inner city kids how to fly airplanes. We're trying to propel them into careers with the airlines, you know, as, um, as captains and first officers on these uh, airliners. We also teach them about drones. So at 16, you can get a drone license and we've uh, certificated several of them that can now go and make money flying drones. We also introduce them to aerospace uh, engineering, aerospace science through our rocketry program. We progress a student from the age of 10 through, well, you can be with us till you're 99 from low power rockets to high power rockets that can go, you know, 100,000 feet up. Telemetry, um, GPS on board, so you can find the rocket once it lands. And we're hoping that this uh, awakens in these inner city kids, the love for physics, uh, math, engineering, and science, as well as art. That's how we reach out to the community. And uh, how did the Tuskegee Airmen help to decelerate the military? <clears throat> they fought two battles. Uh, during World War II, all the armed services 
where African Americans were involved had this uh, motto of double victory. Uh, we fought against the Germans or the Japanese and won, and the victory against racism and segregation at home. Now, we didn't quite win that battle, but we made a lot of strides. We taught the, the military that it was, as Roscoe Brown would say, stupid to have two separate training bases, one for African-Americans, one for Caucasians, when you could save money by merging them together. That was part of the impetus for Order 9981 by Truman to integrate the services. When we performed as we did during the war, that also told them that the 1925 War College study was baloney. It said that African Americans were not smart enough, were not brave enough um, to handle complex equipment, much less fly an airplane. And the only thing they were good for were driving trucks, being orderlies or servants of officers, uh, loading, unloading ships, nothing in the way of combat. And African Americans showed that they were excellent in the air, if not the best. And on the ground, uh, they showed they were also on par with any other soldier in the military. So that prompted, along with pressure from the NAACP, people like A. Philip Randolph, uh, prompted uh, the America to, or Truman, to sign that order to integrate the armed services. Tell me a story about the officers club that you mentioned before. At every base the airmen went to, uh, they were denied access to the officers club. Some of their training was delayed because of this battle. Uh, for instance, the 332nd was thrown out of Selfridge here in Michigan because they insisted on going to the officers club and they were sent south to uh, Godman Field, Kentucky. In Freeman Field, Indiana, the 477th Bomber Squadron uh, mounted a protest, a peaceful protest. There's a book written about it called Freeman Field Mutiny. <clears throat> and in that protest, they two by two entered the officer's club that they were ordered not to go to. And it took about four or five evenings of them entering the officer's club every uh, 15, 20 minutes. You know, two of them would go in, sit down, order drinks, they were arrested, put under house arrest, and court-martialed. They flew them down also to uh, a base in the south, Godman Field, Kentucky, and there Thurgood Marshall came in to defend them. Only two of them were convicted because they liked to talk a lot. If they had, you know, kind of kept quiet, they they have escaped that. And now this was a felony conviction which followed them the rest of their lives until Bill Clinton expunged their records. So Roger Terry out of California, who, who has now passed away, and the other gentleman who passed away before his record was expunged, they had their records expunged uh, in the end. There were several airmen who said, no, leave my record the same. I want history, military record to show what actually happened at Freeman Field, Indiana, in April of 1945. They never saw combat because their commanders uh, were transferring, the, transferring them from place to place because they had this, um, this, how you say, ability to fight the system. So they never saw combat. If the war had gone on, the idea was to bring the 332nd from Europe, match them up with the 477th and send them to Japan to fight the Japanese. Now, in some respect, I would have loved to have seen that, African-Americans protecting African-Americans in combat. But I'm glad that nobody had to go to Japan to fight. Um, sorry about the atomic bomb, but it was good that the war ended. Tell me about the officers that benefited from the Tuskegee program, such as Benjamin Davis, and uh, Daniel Shelby James. So there were there were several. Um, you had Lucius Theus, who went in as a buck private, ended up being a two-star general 
in charge of all of the finances for the United States Air Force, uh, Chappie James, who um, was a, a rebel in his own right, he was told by Benjamin L. Davis, you'll never make general officer. Uh, he, he had what we call a, a fighter pilot uh, attitude. Uh, this is an attitude you needed to have in a single engine fighter uh, fighting the enemy. And Chappie James had that. I'll tell you a story about him coming into a base in the Washington state area. And I don't know if the name Scott Crossfield uh, rings a bell, but this was one of America's best test pilots. And I was invited to have dinner with Scott Crossfield and another gentleman. Um, we, were, we were talking and the other gentleman mentioned Chappie James and Scott Crossfield just reared up and talked about, oh, he's ahead of his time. He was rushing things. And what had happened, Chappie James got to this air base in Washington state, saw the swimming pool full of people went and got his swimming trunks, did a cannonball into the pool. And of course, they immediately get, get, got everybody out of the pool. They drained the pool, disinfected it. And Scott Crossfield just could not understand why Chappie James would do such a thing. But that's the kind of attitude Chappie James had. And that took him to four-star general ahead of Benjamin O. Davis. He was... Uh, head of, of Strategic Air Command, SAC. Regrettably, he died of a heart attack early. Uh, his son actually became a general officer in the Air Force. Benjamin O. Davis is everybody's um, hero. Uh, the airmen talk about him uh, with glowing warmth uh, all the time. Now, this was a man who went to the Air Force Academy and for four years, no one interacted with him unless it was uh, a military duty. So there was no friendship, no um, camaraderie. He ate by himself, slept by himself. Pretty much they were trying to ignore him. And out of 400 and some graduates, he was number 30 or so in his class. Now, his father was also one of the first African-American generals in the United States Army. So he was kind of groomed to be in this position. He was the, in the first class of Tuskegee Airmen to go through the program, and they chose him as its leader. So he was the leader, the commander of the 332nd, and later the uh, combined 332nd, 477th at... Um, Lockburn in Kentucky. He had this aura about him that commanded respect, yet in the evening, he'd take off his tie, sit down at the card table, drink, play cards, uh, and in the morning, you had to respect him as your commander. In the evening, he was your friend. So he was talked about glowingly. He, after the war, became the guy who developed the security for the airlines. So he worked for the FAA and developed the um, security system that was in place up until 9-11. It's also rumored that he started the air show or um, the teams like the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds. So he started the Thunderbirds and then the Blue Angels uh, came about also from the Navy. It's reported that he was the one who came up with that idea. And that probably came from the 1949 gunnery meet. They were at Lockbourne in Ohio. And the word came around that we need your best uh, three pilots and one alternate to go to Las Vegas and compete in this competition. This competition hadn't been done since before World War II. So World War II came, the competition stopped. After World War II, they picked it up again. But now, instead of being the Army Air Corps, it's the United States Air Force. So 1949, the United States Air Force had this Top Gun competition. Tuskegee Airmen went 
And as they were leaving, Benjamin Davis said to them, this is the kind of person he was. If you don't win, don't come back. They went, they won the competition, and of course, came back um, as, as heroes. That was swept under the rug for years uh, until uh, that trophy was discovered. So that's the kind of um, men the Tuskegee Airmen were. They had other uh, airmen who made general officer after World War II. Tell us, uh, what major obstacles did the Tuskegee Airmen overcome in your mind? <clears throat> One was the obstacle that African-Americans can't do anything, you know, that, that we're dumb, scared. They, they broke down those barriers. Other obstacles was they set themselves up as examples. You talk to any airline pilot today or any military pilot today, and he'll tell you he's standing on the shoulders of Tuskegee Airmen. So that was an obstacle. They, they made themselves examples and heroes for the rest of America to look up to. And we still do today. How did the, uh, the government change the hearts and minds of the Department of Defense uh, and the Air Corps in general? Through their combat record. When you're escorting fighters <clears throat> and you're losing very few bombers to enemy uh, aircraft action, not only is the upper commander looking at you, but the men in those bombers are looking at you and saying, I want you to escort me next time we go on a mission. Uh, so <clears throat> they changed the hearts and minds of a lot of people. In fact, I was in Washington State visiting a friend I saw a car with 15 Air Force uh, emblem on it. The gentleman got out. He was of the right age. So I asked him, did uh, you fly a bomber in World War II? And did the 332nd escort you? And this man began to tell me stories. He came to tears. And it was like, if it hadn't been for them, I wouldn't be here today talking to you. So they changed the hearts and minds of a lot of people, but not enough people until the mid 90s when we started to get the, the first movie, Tuskegee Airmen, which um, was put out by HBO. And then in 2012 or so, it was uh, George Lucas who came out with Red Tails. Now America is beginning to wake up and see what the Tuskegee Airmen and actually all African-Americans in the military did for the country during World War II. Well, tell me, how was the uh, success of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, experiment uh, looked at throughout the country? <clears throat> in 1978, which is about the time I started, um, you know, I got to Detroit. If you ran into a Tuskegee Airman, and I actually ran into some, didn't realize it, they wouldn't talk about it because nobody would believe it. America did not know that there were African-American ground troops, combat troops, or even fighter pilots. So the airmen were quiet about their experience because no one would believe them. It wasn't until later that they began to tell their story. And I must say that in Detroit, I was one of the guys who began to bring that out of them because I. Not only did I go to Alexander Jefferson's house, but I went to several of the other airmen. Once I met the group, I started visiting houses to sit on living room couches to listen to their story. That's when they started coming up with the idea, we have to tell this story, we have to create a museum. And they tried to create one in Tuskegee, Alabama. Didn't have the money to purchase the land. And decided here in Detroit, since Coleman Young, a Tuskegee Airman, was mayor, we actually got a house and we're, we're able to uh, get the Detroit Historical Society to come in and help us uh, make an exhibit, collect artifacts, and curate a museum. And where did the name Red Tails come from? <laughs> Every unit in World War II 
had some identifier on the airplane. So bombers are flying along. You see an airplane off in the distance and you're in radio silence. That airplane comes closer and closer. You can tell it's a P-51, but now with the distinct marking on the tail, I can tell what squadron it is. And out of that squadron, or I can tell the group and the squadron by the trim tabs. So the, the 332nd fighter group had red tails. There were other fighter groups that had checkerboard tails. Some had yellow tails. And that's how you would identify the fighter group. If you wanted the squadron, you would look at the trim tabs. And each squadron had a different color trim tab. So it was purely for identification. Red was not something they chose. That's just kind of what happened. Uh, and we're, we're glad that it was red because now it's quite a popular name and means a lot. Tell me about the uh, fact that the uh, Tuskegee Airmen saved a lot of bombers from being destroyed on uh, your flights to uh, North uh, Africa and also Europe. Uh, what is the true story about the bomber situation? So the true story is Tuskegee Airmen had uh, maybe a little bit of an advantage uh, due to racism. The 99th was the first uh, squadron to go overseas. Now, squadron is made up of 16 airplanes um, plus pilots. And they got overseas and were taken in by another um group so they had to be added to a group now this group was very gracious and helped them with their combat training you know here in the states you can do a lot of training but combat training talking to someone who's actually been in combat that's a whole nother level of training they got that training uh, graciously from another caucasian group while that was going on the 332nd fighter group was being formed at tuskegee alabama once they were considered operational, they went over to uh, Europe or Italy. They said, hmm, so let's take the 99th and add it to the 332nd. So instead of three squadrons, the 332nd had four, which means they could put up 16 more airplanes than any other squadron in the area. That was one advantage. Another advantage was because of racism, the only place you could teach an African-American to fly an airplane was Tuskegee Army Airfield in Alabama. And that could only handle so many men at a time. Getting replacements overseas was very slow. So Benjamin O. Davis, uh, contrary to what some believe, Benjamin O. Davis asked the 15th Air Force if he could have his men fly 70 missions instead of 50. So now you have more combat experienced pilots in the group. They're flying more missions. And this gave them um, the skill in order to beat the Germans. Now there was a psychological thing that had to, had to happen. <clears throat> you look at guys like, um, Chuck Yeager and his wingmen, who uh, are all famous, you know, came back, broke the sound barrier. Their objective was to get to the, to the status of ace. If you shot down five airplanes, you could call yourself ace. In order to do that, you, you would chase Germans trying to shoot them down. Germans quickly caught on to that. Oh, they're going to chase us will send out a decoy. So decoy draws them away from the bombers. Now the real attack force comes and attacks the bombers with little or no protection. Benjamin O. Davis, in his wisdom, said to the airmen, if you leave the bombers, you will be court-martialed. So he ordered them to stay with the bombers. Don't go chasing after glory. 
leave the status of ace alone. What we want to do is bring these men back home, these bombers back home to fight another day. And that's what the airmen did. They stayed with the bombers. They didn't follow the decoys. So the Germans had to come up with another strategy. And that was to go head to head. Uh, toward the end of the war, you know, we're talking 43, 44, and the 45, the skill level of the German Air Force pilot was, <laughs> was lowering. In the German army, <laughs> you fought on the front line until the war was over or you died. So a lot of their skilled pilots were lost to combat. There was no one to go home and teach the next person how to fight in combat. So their pilots came up for combat less skilled than a lot of the Americans. So that's kind of how the airmen got their reputation for escorting bombers. Now, Benjamin O. Davis was being con congratulated one day uh, by um, a general officer. And he said uh, that, you know, your guys in 200 missions never lost a bomber not realizing uh, that they had flown 225 missions. So that's how the myth got started. In 200 missions, we never lost a bomber. It became, we never lost a bomber. And while I was president of Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, the historian dug up this research or presented his research that said we lost 25 uh, bombers to enemy action during the war. The airmen finally accepted that, but they were very proud of, uh, and still are very proud of their record of only losing about 25 bombers, which if you compare with other units, the airmen got, you know, 98% on the exam and everyone else was in the 70s, uh, you know, score range. So they were the best at escorting bombers. And what role did Eleanor Roosevelt play in regards to this for us? <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt played a role with all people of color during World War II. She was actually fighting for um, the um, Indian, the American Indians, uh, any disparaged group she was fighting for. And the airman was no... Um, exception. While she was at a meeting at Tuskegee Institute at the time, she heard about the guys flying airplanes. Now, this was the civilian pilot training program. And she went over to the field and asked Chief Anderson to take her for a flight. Secret Service, of course, was like, no, you can't do that. No, it's too dangerous. They had no confidence in the black man flying an airplane anyway. She insisted took a ride with Chief Anderson, just loved it, and spoke to her husband about starting the program for African-Americans in um, the military. That was her role uh, directly with the airmen, but she was a fighter for all people of color during World War II to get them involved in the fight. What type of uh, recognition as far as decorations? And awards that the received in World War II? Uh, they've got a lot, and I, I can't remember them all, but distinguished flying crosses, you know, with oak leaf clusters, uh, all kinds of medals uh, for shooting down aircraft, for uh, incapacitating ships with their airplanes, destroying targets on the ground, trains, and just, you know, causing mayhem, if you will, for the enemy. Once they were done escorting uh, bombers, they were allowed to go down to the deck and attack targets. So they've got a lot of uh, accommodations uh, for that <clears throat> during uh, World War II. And you look at the other units, the 761st Tank Battalion, they've got uh, presidential citations for their 180 days in combat, continuous combat. 
unbelievable. Um, so <clears throat> African Americans, you know, showed the country that they were brave, they could fight, and they could do a good job. Now, did they complete all their phases as uh, as one at one base or several bases? <clears throat> it was several bases. So we can talk about the uh, the the training. You would go to Moton Field, which was attached to Tuskegee Institute, and you would do about nine weeks of uh, primary training. That would be in a a Stearman or a PT-17 or a PT-13, depending on the engine. If you pass that, then you would go to basic training, which would be at Tuskegee Army Airfield, about 10 miles northwest of what is now the university. There you would fly a BT-13 and an AT-6. The AT-6 was the advanced trainer. From the advanced trainer, you would go into a fighter and some of the guys after basic training would transition to twin engine and fly bombers. If you went the bomber track, you had um, two other guys in the aircraft that were um, licensed or certificated, the bombardier and the navigator. They had to have special training. And that training required the bomber crew to fly uh, simulated missions and drop, um, you know, dummy bombs on dummy targets. You would go to um, Hondo Field, I believe, in Texas, uh, Freeman Field, Indiana, Godman Field in Kentucky for some of this specialized training. So bomber crews were all over the, uh, the country, if you will, uh, doing this specialized training. For fighter pilots, they came to Selfridge. The Great Lakes offers a coastline similar to the coastline of France, and they were planning the invasion of France. Now, the invasion of France, you know, was supposed to happen in Normandy, and it was also supposed to happen in southern France. They realized they didn't have enough material to go to southern France, so they only invaded northern France, and it wasn't until August that they invaded southern France. And that's where Alexander Jefferson was, was shot down. <clears throat> so, they, so they came to Michigan to simulate the, the coastline of, of France, did training here. Do you have a video or uh, some type of DVD that we could share at our museum here in New Jersey, if possible? I'm sure we do. Uh, I have a a six minute video that kind of gives a, a synopsis of the airmen. And in our own museum, we have a video that, that does. I just have to get um, with the, you know, the, the curators and, and get that to you. Yeah, because we would like to have that information in regards to uh, our museum here in New Jersey. Also to emphasize Black History Month and, uh, and just on occasion things where people come to visit, they can see Okay, I'll, I'll work on that. And in conclusion, tell me this. Uh, we covered quite a bit, and I really, really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I could talk about this all day. Um, what I'd like to add <clears throat> to what I've already said, uh, we have a unique museum here. It's, it's a, leave, uh, a living, uh, breathing, growing museum. Now, of course, the historical artifacts, they're pretty much the same set, but watching young people come through our doors and leave with a confidence to be airline pilots, military pilots, that is the most gratifying thing uh, to me even more than my job that I had for 25 years. Uh, and that's what we want uh, America to realize, that we are here to tell the history of the Tuskegee Airmen, but also to make more history with young people, especially underrepresented people 
here in the city of Detroit. We're hoping to sprout this kind of attitude amongst other cities. And it, it's already happening. You have in um, uh, the New York area, uh, Tuskegee Airmen Flight School in Memphis, uh, Tennessee, another one, uh, Luke Weathers, uh, run by the Organization of, of Aerospace Professionals in Compton, California, another, in Georgia, even another. So the legacy of the airmen is living on through uh, the museum as well as other groups who share the same um, goals and aspiration. Our mission is to keep making Tuskegee Airmen into the future. And to do this, we do need funds. We do need money. Although we're offering it free to young people, uh, it does cost money. And that's um, what we do and what makes us uh, happy here in, in Detroit. Speaking of funding, uh, are you funded by the city of Detroit or government agencies? <laughs> uh, the city of Detroit gives us no direct funding, but they do allow us to live here at Detroit City Airport uh, for free. They realize what we're offering is of value to the city. You know, when you invite kids out and give them free flight lessons, when you take them on tours of the military base, the FAA facilities, you're offering an in-kind service to the city. And they repay us with uh, free rent here at City Airport. The majority of our funding comes from individuals across the United States, either through our website or through our direct mail uh, campaign. We will soon start a $50 million campaign to build a new facility here at Detroit City Airport. We realize we need, we need classrooms, um, we need more exhibit space. We're about to purchase a BT-13, the basic trainer. We have two Stearmans and one AT-6. All three of those aircraft were at one time at Moton Field or Tuskegee Army Airfield. We can trace the serial numbers back to those uh, army bases, that makes them authentic, historic Tuskegee Airmen aircraft. The BT-13 we're gonna buy is not, does not have that history, but it is a representative of the aircraft the airmen use in combat. After that comes the purchase of a P-51 Mustang. We'll paint that in the colors of Harry Stewart, one of the pilots who won the 1949 gunnery meet. And also, uh, caused the demise of three German aircraft. Uh, so that's kind of what we have planned for the museum side and the um, flight school or flight academy side, just producing more young people who are going to be engineers, scientists, pilots, flight attendants, air traffic controllers. We promote all of these uh, job descriptions here at the museum. One question I'd like to ask is, um, why did the Army choose the ski Alabama to train black aviation cadets? <laughs> That's a good question, and it brings up the Negro Airmen Association, which was in Chicago and Los Angeles. Now, this was started uh, by Bessie Coleman and Willa Brown. Willa Brown uh, married a guy named Coffee, and they started the school to teach African-Americans how to fly. As you know, Bessie Coleman, the first African-American female pilot had to go all the way to France to get her pilot license. When she came back, she wanted to teach other African-Americans how to fly. They developed quite an organization that did air shows uh, as well as taught people how to fly the airplane and work on the airplane. When the army put out the RFP for someone to teach African-Americans how to fly, Willa Brown submitted a proposal. Her proposal was denied because they said Alabama has more flying weather than Chicago. And the other sinister thing was the Southern white male knows best how to control the Negro. So a lot of your training bases were in the South for African-Americans. Thomas, do you have a, a portable exhibit that you like mobilize around the, the, the 
favorite region. Will people set up and uh, talk more about the uh, see here in the program? We are developing a mobile exhibit. Well, we'll, we'll call it a traveling exhibit. <laughs> And it's going to highlight the civilian pilot training program, which was a, a program started before World War II to get more men involved in aviation, uh, realizing they needed people to ferry aircraft. They said, for every 10 males, you have to teach one female how to fly. And these females would later become the WASP, the Women Air Service Pilot. The WASP refused to let African-American females into the WASP service. So even though we had African-American females who were taught how to fly at seven of these HBCUs, we're now trying to trace what happened to them after the war. We know some of them actually went to Tuskegee and some of them were instructors there, but others kind of just faded into, into life. So that's one of the stories we want to tell. <clears throat> we also want to tell the story of Walter Payton Manning. This was a Tuskegee Airman who was shot down, survived the, uh, the crash of the airplane, was put in jail by the Germans, and the next day was extracted from jail by a mob and lynched on a light pole. They beat him up first and lynched him. We want to tell his story. And a few other little known facts about the Tuskegee Airmen. That's going to be the uh, crux of our traveling display. Now, were all your students in the beginning were they all white? They were all white in the beginning. <laughs> and as time went on, you got more African American instructors. Uh, Gilbert Cargill, a resident of Detroit, was one of those instructors. Now, there was a field named after uh, one of your. Uh, pilot, uh, I think it was Tedra, T-C-H-A-N-U-T-E. Um, doesn't ring a bell. Now, we had a um, remote control airplane field named after Alexander Jefferson. The city did that just this past November. So I'll tell you, it's been a great interview. And I certainly appreciate your time. And I apologize for the delay and the, the sound effects and so forth, but it's been a great interview. And I'm sure that uh, when we get this back to you, you'll appreciate what we did. And we're going to submit this, submit this to all uh, museums uh, for black history and also for future information about the Tuskegee here. I mean, in our museum itself here at uh, New Jersey. So uh, thank you very much, sir. And thank you for everything you've done. And uh, you've done a fantastic job. I want to understand up here. And, uh, Detroit. And anyway, we can say so let us know. Well, thank you very much, and and you are very welcome. I, I've enjoyed the privilege of speaking with you today.